Bingo, we're back. It's 3 o'clock rock here on Think Tech. And we're having a show called Energy in America. I love that. We're going to talk about energy in America uh, with uh, Lou Pugliaresi, who is the president of EPRINC. And EPRINC, you should know, is the Energy Policy Research Foundation, an energy policy think tank in Washington, D.C. We are delighted to have you on the show, Lou. Thank you, Jay. Uh, so um, we're going to call this discussion the realities of renewable energy development and try to, you know, make people understand things they may not already understand. And when we spoke before, uh, you pointed out to me that we now have a renaissance in American resources that's a game changer. Can you talk about the renaissance and how it is a game changer? Yes, I would say, uh, what the first thing to understand about this is that this is quite new. And what's unique about this is that historically, when we went out to look for oil and gas, it was found in what we call geologic traps. And those traps were uh, collected oil and natural gas from migrations from a geologist called source rock. Source rock is prolific, it's everywhere, and it's everywhere there's oil and gas production. And the Renaissance in the United States, and we have some slides we can get to later on this, but the Renaissance really is the capacity to produce from the source rock. And the interesting thing, there's a couple of interesting facts about this. One, source rock is everywhere. So we are no longer reserve limited. And second, the future of oil and gas prices will be driven not by the ability to find oil and gas. Mm. Nobody drills a dry hole anymore in the U.S. It will be determined by production costs. Mm -hmm. So we have moved from the discovery, the exploration process, to a manufacturing process. And this changes everything and has completely upended the whole notion of peak oil. Well, is it now, you know, I'm reminded of that movie, The Marathon Man with Dustin Hoffman. And the, the question that they always asked, is it safe? Is it safe? So my question to you is, this, is the Renaissance safe? Because we've, you know, we've had some, uh, some pushback, if you will. On LNG, yeah, so, what does I, mean, that I mean? think that you do hear people who are concerned of the, the production from source rock generally entails drilling a long vertical hole, actually, almost sometimes over 10,000 feet, wow. and then a very long uh, a horizontal shaft in which the production process is initiated by putting water down through the pipe under very high pressure. But that's quite, quite uh, deep. I mean, m most of the work by EPA and everyone suggests that it is, quote, safe. It's not affecting the aquifer. And uh, most of the problems that occur in the oil and gas development occur on the surface. Someone spills water. But actually, I don't think hydro... When people say they're opposed to hydraulic fracturing, they don't know what, it, what they mean by that. What they really mean is they don't like industrial development. Mm -hmm. So if you go to... Texas, where there's a long history of oil drilling, it's not a problem. When it's introduced into new areas or close to residential, people don't like the noise, they don't like the trucking, the hauling of the water. It's not the hydraulic fraction, I think, hydraulic fracturing that people really are opposed to. It's the industrial development. But if you want economic growth, you're going to have to have industrial development. You just need to do it in a sound way. Well, it sounds like what you're saying is if you have cheap energy, uh, you have a better chance at industrial development. And, and, that, and that any organization or society or community that has the advantage of cheap energy is going to be economically more, more prosperous. Yes, and what we say is this. Look, you can say, you can go around and say, look, I don't want an offshore drilling. Or I don't want hydraulic fracturing, fracturing. But what you can't say is it's free to do that. Because there was a period of time when the world price of oil was $100 and the actual cost of producing oil in the U.S. was closer to $30 or $40 a barrel. That difference, mm -hmm. right, that difference in economic value showed up in higher corporate profits, more jobs, larger taxes to state and local government, and larger and more rapid economic growth in the United States. In fact, here's an interesting statistic. And one of the reasons why the Obama administration never really shut down hydraulic fracturing. In the first Obama term, in the absence of the North American petroleum renaissance, U.S. economic growth would have been zero instead of 2%. And 
President Obama would not have been reelected. <laughs> he understood this more than his staff. Mm -hmm. And so when, when it came time to issue regulations and everything, one of the things they wanted to make sure was they didn't kill it. The next interesting thing about this development is that the North American Petroleum Renaissance took place largely on private land. That means all the regulations were promulgated locally. Mm -hmm. You did not have to get a, what's called a National Environmental Policy Act review. You did not have to do endless uh, interventions from in different environmental groups and public interest groups. So if you look at development on federal land, actually production across federal land in this period of time, say since 2006, mm -hmm. has declined. This took place on private land in which there were private uh, mineral rights, and this explains a great deal. I wrote a piece in the Wall Street Journal about this, in fact. So this explains a lot of what happened. So uh, I, let me just um, go back for a minute and, and um, make sure that our listeners and viewers understand where you're coming from. You're not representing uh, oil and gas interests. Uh, you are completely impartial and, bi and unbiased, am I right? Yes, yeah, so, so I should explain our funding. Maybe that would be helpful. The Energy Policy Research Foundation has been around since 1944. And we're kind of in that space which we call petroleum economics and public policy. We actually get funding from the Defense Department. We did a big project for them on the strategic implications of the North American Petroleum Renaissance. We helped the Department of Energy with their quadrennial energy review. And our private sector funding is untied. Mm -hmm. So our, our board and our chairman and I set the agenda. Mm -hmm. We're heavily involved, actually, in fuels policy as well. Mm -hmm. Well, with that, with that in mind, um, I'd like to explore with you the nature of the Renaissance. The Renaissance means we found more. Uh, the Renaissance means we have better technology to um, you know, find, find and use and process more. Um, what, what are we talking about in scope here? Um, is this enough to last for a thousand years? Is this enough so, to satisfy our needs for a substantial period? So, as mo most economists believe that the notion of peak oil that we would run out is a kind of ridiculous uh, notion. We, we ran out of whales, so we started to run out of whale oil, and we discovered petroleum. So petroleum, oil, and natural gas, they'll be around until something better comes along. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes the government thinks it knows what's better and tries to force different alternatives and you know we have people forget in the 70s we had the sin fuels corporation and we spent billions of dollars on the sin fuels corporation but it was always five dollars more than the price of oil <laughs> it never really worked out so one of the big themes in our research is what things cost is really important it's good to spend a lot of time figuring out what stuff costs yeah well uh, so okay so right now uh, oil is still cheap and, and uh, gas, yes, I presume, so I, I is cheaper yet. So how does that comparison work going forward? Will, uh, will gas get more expensive? Will oil get more expensive? And what happens? So that, that is a, so a fundamental issue in all kinds of research is what's the long-run price of oil? Yeah. What's the long-run price of natural gas? Now, in the United States, we just did a study called Shale Gas, The Road Ahead. And you can pull it right off our website. And in it, we showed that uh, even at a very, very low gas price, the U.S. has sufficient reserves to meet all the coming demands over the next 30, 40 years, including LNG exports. exports. Actually, many people might not understand, we are exporting large volumes of natural gas by pipeline to Mexico, yet the price of gas has remained quite cheap. Now, if you talk about moving gas from the United States to other countries, there you, you do need to liquefy it, put it in a tanker, and absorb those costs. So, but we do know that the long-run price of natural gas in the U.S., and I think you could take this to the bank, mm -hmm. is going to be below $4 a thousand. Mm -hmm. So do you think it'll stay below the price of oil? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And the oil price may go through ups and downs, I'll tell you a good story. We had some of the world's best extraction technologists in a room in Houston about two years ago. And what many people don't understand is the big oil companies have only started doing research on shale oil and gas in the last couple of years. This has largely been done by independent drillers and small entrepreneurs. 
But what's on the drawing board is incredible. Uh, the use of big data, uh, the very precise uh, location of where you place your uh, your horizontal uh, uh, you know drilling and your your production facilities. As I said, the, we are not reserve limited. Yeah. We have vast reserves, not just in the U.S. Aust Australia, Argentina, Russia. And those so those the, reserves actually grow with the better technology. I can, exactly. I can tell you that uh, Hawaii, at the University of Hawaii, Manoa, um, has a, a very substantial uh, scientific effort going at the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology. Lots of geologists there. And they're really at the cutting edge. Um, and I think, you know, just, just talk, and I do, I talk to them every week. Um, I, I feel that um, the science is growing while we watch, and the science affects what you're talking about in terms of identifying, getting data, and identifying where it is, how much of it is there, uh, and how we can extract it. So this is a moving, this is a moving, improving area all the time. Yeah, the future price of oil and gas is going to be determined by technology of extraction. Yeah. That's it. So uh, let's take a short break, Lou. We take a break uh, 15 minutes in and come back and talk about how all this affects our, our, um, our, um, um, our strategies, what, what kind of strategies we need to formulate, who will do that, how they will do it, and what are the goals in establishing those strategies. Uh, okay. That's uh, Lou P P Pugliar P Pugliarsi. Uh, I knew I'd get that wrong. P Pugliar <laughs> Pularisi. Pularisi of uh, e EPRINC. That's the, uh, he's the president of Energy Policy Research Foundation, which is an energy policy think tank in Washington. We'll be right back after this short break. Yeah. Thank you for watching Think Tech. I'm Grace Chang, the new host for Global Connections. You can find me here live every Thursday at 1 p.m. where we'll be talking to people around the islands or visiting the islands who are connected in various aspects of global affairs. So please tune in and aloha and thanks for watching. Aloha, I'm Carl Campagna, host of Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers and Reformers. I hope you join us over the next several weeks as we take a deep dive into biofuels in Hawaii and explore the alternative fuels supply chain necessary for the local and global transition towards transportation fuel sustainability. Join us as we have good conversations with our farmers, our producers, our conversion technologies, our investors, and our legislators as we try to achieve our transportation sustainability goals. See you soon. Aloha, I'm Kawi Lucas, host of Hawaii is my mainland here on Think Tech Hawaii every Friday afternoon at 3 p.m. Start your Pauhana weekend off with the show where I talk to people about issues pertinent to Hawaii. You can see my previous shows at my blog, kawilucas.com, and also on Think Tech's show, sorry. We're back. We're live uh, here on Energy in America uh, with uh, Lou uh, Pugliarisi, the president of the um, Energy Policy Research Foundation, EPRINC, uh, an energy policy think tank in Washington, D.C. And we're talking about the realities of renewable energy development. So one of the things we should cover is what you told me before about the realities of diminishing returns, because that's got to be factored in any strategy. Yes, yeah, so if you, if you look at any, one of the problems is the relative prices of fuels change all the time. And one of the, the, the big fundamental shift that's taken place is that fossil fuels have become a lot cheaper. And they're likely to stay cheaper for a long time. Just has to do with this technological breakthrough and hydraulic fracturing and the production from source rock. And when that happens, Sometimes governments have a target, like say they want to go to 100% renewables or they want to get 55 miles to the gallon. And it sounds like a good idea. But the, re the way economists think about it and business people, well, what are you buying at the margin? How much does it cost to go from not just A to B, but then finally 
ecstasy. And that's what's one of the problems that's happening. Right now, for example, in the auto industry, the average automobile in the United States is removing 99% of the criteria pollutants that it used to spew in 1963. So we're, we've, made a long, you know, we've made a long road and we've got a lot of success. So one of the issues that comes up is, okay, do you really need to go that last five yards? Is it really worth it? Maybe that, those resources should be spent in terms of climate abatement or whatever you want to do in something more useful. Mm -hmm. And you can look upon this in the sort of 100% uh, target that the state of Hawaii has for renewable fuel for the power sector. You know, that strikes me as a very bizarre way to think about the Hawaii's role in climate and, and whether and what's going to mean for the cost of electricity in Hawaii. What I hear you saying is that at the end of the line, when you get close to 100%, the cost is so great that you have to make a value judgment, an economic judgment, on whether it's worth taking that last, whatever it is, 5%. And maybe sometimes you don't go to 100%. Right. You use those resources for something else because the curve is so steep. And this is particularly true if you have a model in which you say the long-run price of gas, the long-run price of oil, is a lot lower than you thought it was going to be. And, and of course, the power sector is a little different than other kinds of businesses. You probably do want a diversified strategy because you can't predict the cost of all fuels. But, and you know, there's some probably very good work done at UH, I think in the energy, uh, ener there's an energy research group there that's probably looked at this a bit. Yes. I haven't seen if they've done anything. I know they've done some interesting work on solar. For example, if you do an Excel sheet on solar, it's a loser. It's a loser, rooftop solar. It sounds great, but you have to look at the cost of the capital and the value it's providing to the customer. Now, some cases in some islands, it makes a lot of sense. But in some cases, it doesn't make a lot of sense. It's too expensive. It's not yielding enough. And, uh, and so, so these are really difficult things because the public gets really fixed on these. Issues. Yes, well, the public, you know, you cannot assume the public has a sophisticated understanding, even after years of public discussion. Let me, let me go to one other point that you mentioned, which was, to me, very provocative. That is, uh, sometimes, you know, people get all fixated on saving the climate when they should really allocate those resources to saving themselves. Because, yeah, say, so in a place like Hawaii, we can't case. save the whole world. Right. We if need you to think save about, ourselves. Yeah, if you think about Hawaii, what's the main economic driver of Hawaii? It's tourism. And it's the natural beauty of Hawaii. Let's say it's the Aloha spirit. You could say it's just a wonderful destination. And if I were a sort of government planner in Hawaii, I would say, gee, why are we spending these enormous resources to end up with a very costly electric grid? And because we're trying to, you know, Hawaii is too small to have any effect on the world climate. It will not, I don't care what we do in Hawaii, it's going to have no effect. It's just too small. But we're really on the front line of climate, you know, sea level rise, oh, yeah. storms. So at the margin, you should be putting your money into adaption. You should be putting your money into preserving the economic base that makes Hawaii such a wonderful place to visit. And for the life of me, I don't understand this mis this imbalance in the priorities yeah. among the leadership in Hawaii. Yeah, so if, if uh, you know that it's going to be bad storms, and I think we do know that, yeah. <clears throat> then you, you need to set aside something uh, to deal with climate change, to deal with sea level rise, to deal with those storms. Um, so if I have, say, a billion dollars left over uh, and I've achieved a certain percentage of clean energy, uh, I, should, I should take that billion and put it into saving our economy, saving our environment in the face of those storms and climate change. Absolutely. If you look at, I, I don't recall the number, I think the state of Hawaii budget ban almost $200 million in subsidies for rooftop solar? I, I, I don't know. Uh, as I recall, there was a study I saw done out of UH Manoa, and I, I think, you know, they had to stop issuing those subsidies. It became such a burden on the budget. Yes. But those funds would have been much better spent on adaption. It's not a question of, 
what feels good. It's a question of what makes sense for the residents and the citizens of Hawaii. So there's a whole bunch of factors, including the factor uh, that, you, that you have to spend a lot of money to get uh, to clean energy. It's new technology. It requires new infrastructure. Um, you have to have a lot of people working on it. Uh, it doesn't come free. I, I don't think people really understand that. Yeah, it poses a lot of technical and financial risks, which will be borne by the consumers of electricity. Sure. So taking all those things together, Lou, and trying to fashion at least, uh, at least a way of thinking around developing a strategy for the country, and I guess for Hawaii, we're always interested in that. Uh, where do you see, you know, how should we be thinking about this? Well, you know, this is going to require a lot of education because people are sort of locked into a certain worldview of what they need to do. But I do think the governor's position on natural gas is it's a little too restrictive in the sense that he ought to have an open mind about that. Maybe he ought to have a separate commission or some outside independent group say, okay, let's look at four or five strategies going forward including a scenario where natural gas prices are relatively low, where uh, some of the financial risks of, of the 100% uh, renewables are appropriately evaluated. And let's, let's see which kinds of options might make sense, even from a sort of risk diversification point of view going forward. Now, and people, people, have, been, to the cost of the people have been talking about this notion of a bridge fuel. And I guess uh, LNG would be a, a bridge fuel, in other words, Keep, keep, uh, keep things cheap. Uh, in the period, I'm not sure how you define this period, in the period of the middle, that it be between the time we start looking for um, lots of um, clean energy and, and the time we end up with meeting our goals or at least getting to the year in which we were supposed to meet our goals. Um, what do you think of that as an element in, in building the strategy, the, the, the element of a bridge fuel? Yeah, because, you know, it's possible that the alternatives, see, what's going on? We have a kind of central planning mechanism. The government has decided we're going to have renewables, and these are the renewables we're going to have. Wind, solar, whatever. And, uh, but they may not be the cheapest way to go. Uh, there may be other kinds of renewable breakthroughs. There may be breakthroughs in batteries that come along that, that deal with some of the imbalance in the grid. But those breakthroughs aren't here yet. If you look at the U.S., for example, I would say... If you, if you look at sort of solar, wind, all the different things we're doing in the U.S., clearly biofuels, everyone kind of agrees, biofuels has been kind of a bust, right? Yeah. But in, the, in Washington, we mandate the blending of biofuels into the gasoline pool. It's actually increasing the price of gasoline by about 10 cents a gallon in the U.S. And by the way, in the Hawaiian Islands, who are not required by law to blend biofuels. Mm -hmm. That's a self-imposed. Uh, pain you uh, engaged in in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. You're the you, you and Alaska were exempt. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know the other the other thing about this is um, things change, and uh, you know if we weren't aware of that on any given day, the news that day will remind us that things change. You can't count on anything staying the same for even half a day, even a quarter of a day. Just yeah. just watch any news source. So if we develop a strategy, this is a you know conceptual idea develop a strategy and we and we fix on certain steps over a certain period of time you know using certain you know certain parameters i guess and maybe certain variables that change how do we build in um a complete you know disruptive change that happens right in the middle for example a new technology on batteries uh you know for example uh, the, the uh, graphene graphene batteries come in all of a sudden batteries are a whole new ball game um, how do we build that into the strategy? Well, you need, you know, you need an open system in which alternatives can emerge over time. Uh, it's true that if you build a big combined cycle power plant, you're kind of stuck with it, right, for a long time. But, you know, technologies come, uh, disrupted technologies come along often. And that's one of the reasons why we should do research. And I'm a big believer in basic research and even demonstration research. I'm not a believer that the government has the that the government knows what the future looks like and should then have a very centralized plan implemented. Because once the wheels of bureaucracy get rolling, 
they don't seem to be very susceptible oh, yeah. to changes in technology yeah. and in forces in the market. So who looks at that? I mean, just a, a small point, but in the news today, there's a, a wind farm uh, in uh, Olapalakua on the Maui, <clears throat> where the, uh, the, the, the uh, I forget what you call it, the, the top part of the windmill fell off and it stopped the whole farm. This is a pretty big farm. <clears throat> I don't know how many megabytes, but it's a pretty big farm. And it was important for the, the grid in Maui. It fell off, it broke, the whole farm is down. They're probably trying to figure out how to make up for that loss. Um, so maybe this requires uh, some a new adaptation on the strategy. And so my question to you is, who decides? Who should be watching for that windmill to fail? Who should be well, figuring out what to do? Well, the Electric Commission in Hawaii, I forget what it's called. And if you go, and in the U.S., you know, in the U.S., all our uh, independent service operators, we have uh, regulatory bodies in the state. So the U.S. is a very unusual place. The states get to decide what the electric grid looks like. The states get to decide um, how the connections are done and what kinds of uh, regulatory measures should be implemented because we just have this tradition in the U.S. We do have merchant suppliers in other states, and I don't know what the nature of the Hawaiian system is that much. But if you had a pure market-oriented system in Hawaii, my guess is for Oahu, clearly, you would have some big base load, right? and then you would fill it in over time with renewables. Maybe you'd have a little bit of an experimental program. I certainly wouldn't be engaged, because remember, you these are all interruptible supplies. The windmill is a classic case, right? Now, a power plant can go down as well, but I think you know, the windmills are newer technology. They offer certain risks. I would be very cautious about introducing these at a too quick pace. Yeah. One last question before we close, Lou, and that's this. You, you're seeing this from a national point of view, if not an international point of view. And you know, you know what is happening in Hawaii, um, and you know what's happening in other states. Do you feel that there is a national culture of uh, strategy, uh, development, and management emerging these days in the United States? And if not, should there be? No, I think there should be much more attention to cost-based solutions. And I think that we've gotten so locked in to that we know what the right answer going forward is. And we're not making the right trade-offs we may end up imposing very high costs in the, in the price of electricity without thinking about, well, what, what's the value of that high cost? What are we really buying for that? And as I said, to get back to this example in Hawaii, it, it just seems to me quite foolish for the state of Hawaii to put all their resources in trying to have a clean energy grid when, in fact, the payoff to Hawaii is an adaption. Mm -hmm. That's the economic value of the state. Mm -hmm. That's very fresh thinking and something uh, we ought to consider. And uh, I'd like to continue this discussion two weeks hence um, on a given Wednesday at the same time. I hope you'll be available, Lou. I will. Great. That's uh, Lou uh, Pugliarisi. He's the president of uh, EPRINC, which is uh, the Energy Policy Research Foundation, an energy think tank in Washington, D.C. Thank you so uh, much. I just might leave it with one thing is that all the research can be found on our website. Thank you. What is the name of your website? Eprink.org. Great. Thank you, Lou. Aloha. All right. Thank you, Jay.